In this topic, we're going to look at food chains and food webs and energy transfer and ecosystems. So by the end of this topic, you should be able to define a producer, consumer and trophic level and explain how energy losses occur along a food chain and discuss the efficiency of energy transfer between trophic levels. We're also going to look at pyramids of numbers, biomass and energy. The organisms found in a tropical rainforest or any other ecosystem rely on a source of energy to carry out their activities. The ultimate source of energy is sunlight, which is converted into chemical energy by plants and then it's passed on as food from one animal to the next. Now the way in which energy flows from producer to consumer is shown by drawing a food chain. And the arrows in the food chain represent the flow of energy. So notice how the arrow points towards the feeder. So what's a trophic level? Well, each stage in the food chain is called the trophic level. So the first trophic level is represented by the producers. The second is by herbivores and all subsequent ones by carnivores. And the shortest food chain is usually about three levels. The longest one is no longer than five levels. Okay, let's have a look at what a producer is. A producer is a photosynthetic organism that manufactures organic substances using light energy, water, and carbon dioxide. And the rate at which they produce this organic food is referred to as their productivity. So what's a consumer? Well, animals can only gain energy and nutrients by eating other organisms. So those that eat plants are called herbivores, those that eat animals are called carnivores, and those that eat both plants and animals are called omnivores. So herbivores are also referred to as primary consumers, and they're eaten by secondary consumers. So tertiary consumers and quaternary consumers are usually predatory, but they may also be scavengers or parasites. So then what's a decomposer? Well, when producers and consumers die, some energy is locked up in complex organic molecules of which they're made. And this energy is used by a group of organisms that break down these complex materials into simple components again. So in doing this, they release valuable minerals and elements in a form that can be absorbed by the plants. So they contribute to recycling. And the majority of this work is carried out by saprophytic fungi and bacteria, which we call decomposers, and to a lesser extent by certain animals, for example earthworms, which we call detritivores. So these decomposers and detritivores feed on dead organisms. So earthworms feed on dead leaves. And then decomposers feed on feces, urine, and dead leaves, as well as dead organisms. Okay, moving on to a food web. Now, in reality, most animals do not rely upon one single food source. And within a single habitat, many food chains will be linked together to form a food web. So you may notice that a particular animal does not always occupy the same position in a food chain. While herbivores, such as in this case the insect, are always primary consumers, notice how a jaguar is a tertiary consumer when it feeds on tree frogs, but when it feeds on the sloth, it's a secondary consumer. Okay, here's an exam question. Why is it difficult to assign some organisms to trophic levels? Well, some animals always feed at different trophic levels, while others that normally feed at one trophic level may feed at another trophic level in seasons, different seasons, or when the food is scarce. And the food web could start with decomposing matter rather than primary producers.
Okay, let's have a look at the energy losses in food chains. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the sun is the source of all energy for ecosystems. Now, only a very small percentage of this light energy is captured by green plants and made available to successive organisms in the food chain. So these, in turn, only pass on a small fraction of the available energy at each stage. So energy gets lost both within and between the organisms. And plants normally convert between 1% to 3% of the sun's energy available to them into organic matter. So let's have a look at the reasons why. Firstly, 90% of the solar energy is reflected back into space by clouds and dust, or it's absorbed by the atmosphere and then re-radiated. Not all wavelengths of light can be absorbed and used for photosynthesis. Light may not fall on chlorophyll molecules, so some sunlight may pass through the leaves without even falling on the chlorophyll molecule. Or the sunlight may be reflected off the leaves. Low carbon dioxide may limit the rate of photosynthesis, as you can see in this picture here. Okay, let's have a look at why not all the potential chemical energy is available in a plant for the primary consumer. So the chemical potential energy is in plant tissues in various organic molecules, especially carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. And it's from these that primary consumers obtain their energy. However, nearly half of this chemical potential energy is going to be used by the plants. So they release the energy by respiration, using it for purposes, for example, active transport. And during these processes, much energy is going to be lost to the environment as heat. So what is left is then going to be available to the organisms, which feed on the plants. So how is energy lost from plants to primary consumers? So losses do occur between the plants and the primary consumers and only about 10% of the net primary production of plants is used by herbivores for growth. So the low percentage is a result of not all the plant being eaten. For example, you've got some woody tissues and some roots not being eaten. Some parts of the plant are eaten, but they cannot be digested. So they're lost in feces. Some of the energy is lost in excretory materials, for example, urine. And some energy losses occur in respiration and heat loss to the environment. So it's a good idea to remember these four points. So why are trophic levels not more than five levels long? Well, carnivores are slightly more efficient in transferring 20, about 20% of the energy available from their prey into their own bodies. So it's the relative inefficiency of energy transfer between different trophic levels that explains why most food chains have only about four to five trophic levels. Because insufficient energy is available to support a breeding population at trophic levels higher than these. So the biomass of organisms is also less at higher trophic levels and the total amount of energy stored is also less at each level as one moves up the food chain. So have a look at this diagram here. Notice how energy is lost between the different trophic levels. So it, a lot of it is lost as heat during respiration. And notice how the sun, the energy from the sun, only one to 3% of that is used by the primary producers. And then notice how five to 10% goes to the carnivores, the primary co consumers. And then 15 to 20 of that goes to the secondary, 15 to 20% of that goes to the tertiary consumers. So as you go 
Along a food chain, energy is lost at each trophic level. Okay, two other words you might come across are gross primary productivity and net primary productivity. So let's have a look at gross primary productivity, GPP. This is the total production of organic food in a given area and in a given time. So the rate at which plants convert light energy into chemical potential energy is called the productivity or primary productivity. And it's usually in kilojoules or energy transferred per square meter per year. So it depends on the types of plants growing there, their density and the climate. So in this diagram here, you can see that only 1% of solar energy striking producers is captured by photosynthesis. So it's used in GPP. Then you've got NPP. This is the rate of production of organic food after allowing for the energy that is lost via respiration by the plant. So in other words, it's the production of material that can be eaten by consumers. So it's 40% of GPP supports the growth and production of producers. Okay, here's an exam question. The efficiency of energy transfer through a trophic level is calculated by comparing the energy available to that trophic level with the energy available to the next trophic level. So it's been estimated that the efficiency of energy transfer by herbivorous copepods is about 17%. State two factors that are likely to influence the efficiency of energy transfer by herbivorous copepods. While the quantity of phytoplankton, which is digested by the copepods, relative to the quantity which remains undigested. The quantity of digested phytoplankton which is absorbed. The energy from digested material that is lost in excretion and egestion. and the energy from digested phytoplankton that is lost in respiration. And then finally, the energy from digested phytoplankton which is lost in movement. Okay, finishing off, let's have a look at pyramid of numbers. Now you should have covered this during IGCSE, just to recap. Usually the numbers of organisms at lower trophic levels are greater than the numbers at the higher levels. So this can be shown by drawing the lengths proportional to the numbers present at each trophic level. Now you might end up with the pyramid of numbers like this one shown here, where you've got lots of grass being eaten by one rabbit and lots of fleas living on that rabbit. So notice how this pyramid of numbers looks a little bit disproportional. So it's better to use a pyramid of biomass. So biomass is the total mass of plants and or animals in a particular place and it's normally measured over a fixed period of time. So the term is sometimes used to refer to all living organisms on earth or major part of the earth and it may also refer to a plant or animal material that is exploited for fuel or raw materials in industry. So fresh mass is easy to assess, but the varying contents of water make it quite unreliable. So it would be preferable to use dry mass, but this means that the organisms have to be killed. And it also means that you usually have a small sample, which may not be representative. So you can use pyramids of energy. So collecting the data for pyramids of energy can be difficult and complex, but the result is a true representation of the energy flow through a food web, and you don't have any anomalies. So data collected in a given area for a set period of time, and this is usually a year, and the results are much more reliable than those for biomass. 
because two organisms of the same dry mass may store different amounts of energy. Okay, in summary, we've looked at what a producer, consumer, and trophic level is. We've explained how energy is lost along food chains, and we've looked at the efficiency of energy transfer between different trophic levels. And then finally, we looked at pyramids of numbers, biomass, and energy. And that concludes our lesson. The end.